excited that Landon Phillips is here. And he is from Pepperdine University. And Pepperdine is in Malibu. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, uh, let me say that again. Pepperdine is in Malibu, California. And he came to Syracuse, and I'm so happy that he did. Um, so um, I happened to um, be at the OLC conference in, I think it was in November or October. And somehow or another, I happened to be in his presentation, and I was just totally smitten and captivated. So um, he, Landon, is, serves as a multimedia specialist in the technology and learning group at Pepperdine. And his primary responsibilities are assisting faculty in implementing new technologies into their curriculum and producing graphic and video content um, on, um, for his little small corner in, in IT where he works. He also co-teaches a class uh, on Photoshop and is really, really excited about showing us how he incorporates design and technology and principles of gamification into his own instruction. This is the first presentation that I have ever seen of a course that has been beautifully uh, gamified and that has been presented by someone who is um, enthusiastic and dynamic and an incredibly articulate speaker. Um, is his head getting big? Um, <laughs> and, but it's, it's, all, it's, all, it's all totally true. And, and who actually understands learning theory. So I am so very excited to introduce you to Landon Phillips. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's always helpful to have a good hype woman on your side uh, to really just build the pressure right up before that public speaks. Um, but thank you all for being here. Uh, I appreciate uh, you sticking around uh, after our rather late lunch and hope that uh, you can get something interesting out of this presentation. My name, as she said, is Landon Phillips. I'll be presenting today, The Game is Afoot, How Game-Based Learning Can Transform a Class Both On and Offline. So let's get a few introductions out of the way first. Uh, I'll be talking about myself, my class, and my problem. So within 30 seconds, I'm just already opening up to everyone here. It's filling my guts. Um, my self part is easy. I've made sure to definitely accidentally wear the same shirt that I was <laughs> photographed in. So you're all in the right place. This is the right presentation. Um, the class that I teach is uh, called MSCO 371. It's an introduction to Photoshop and design, and therein lies the problem. You see, my class is a lot like a giant pile of Lego. You know, infinite possibilities, infinite potential, but only to those who know how and are motivated enough to realize that potential. So every day I, I'd have students come in and some see that, that big pile of Lego and, and they get wide-eyed and excited. They think, I can't wait to learn this. They're not afraid to get in there, to be pushing buttons, to be trying things out, not afraid to break things. Other students who came in, perhaps having stepped on a Lego in the middle of the night at some point, are a little bit more gun-shy. They don't want to experiment. They don't. They may even actively dislike the program Photoshop. And I think um, there's a lot of baggage that comes in with these students to my class. And I don't know if some of you can relate to this, but teaching, especially a class on graphic design, I try to emphasize a lot that it's not an art class. I'm not here to grade your creativity. That helps, but I'm here more concerned about principles of design, the effort you put in. All those things can be done by anybody. A lot of times that falls on deaf ears, though, because they come in with all these anxieties. They think, oh, I'm not artistic, so I'm not going to do well. Or, oh, I'm not technical, so the whole computer part I'm no good with. Or, oh, I've never used a Mac like the ones in these labs. So before I even open my mouth on the first day of school, they've got at least three solid reasons why they should struggle, if not fail, my class. That's a pretty uphill battle to start with right off the beginning. I'm sure a lot of you other professors can identify with that. Some people say, you know, oh, I'm just not a math person. Or, oh, I'm sorry, I hate economics. Or, oh, I hate, you know, you as a person. There's lots of reasons why students cannot want to be where they are. So really, the name of the game, something that, that was the biggest stumbling block for me was anxiety. Oh, OK, so I promise I have a good reason for subjecting you to that. 
It was not a glitch. It was supposed to sound like that. The reason why is because when you hear that sound, everybody just kind of tenses up. You know, you grit your teeth. You, you, you tighten up. You're on edge. And I wanted us to kind of try to empathize with our students. If we put ourselves in that position, if you're coming into class every day just clammed up because you're nervous about assessment styles or you're nervous that you're not going to be good at this particular type of content, it's very difficult to retain anything that your teacher is telling you and it's almost impossible to develop that deep love of learning of the subject that all of us as professors would love to impart to our students. So if we can't get around this, we get a problem. So then why would I turn to gamification? Why would I think that that would solve my problem? In fact, what, what is gamification to begin with? Well, a generally agreed upon definition is the use of game design elements, like our friend Donkey Kong here, in non-game contexts. Now, I want to go a little bit further than that. For this presentation, I'm actually going to say that's only partially correct. And the reason why is I think it doesn't quite touch on the exact scope or depth of what gamification or game-based learning is capable of. And I love this quote, fun is just another word for learning. Uh, this is attributed to Ralph Koster in his book, A Theory of Fun for Game Design. And it's, most people generally agree with it, but when it comes to their class or their specific instruction, there's always an asterisk. They say, oh yeah, fun learning, uh, you know, we'll have fun, we'll have learning in my class, it's great, but I need to emphasize that I'm a serious academic and I prioritize learning above fun. So if it comes to one or the other, I'm going with learning. And that's a fine attitude to have. Nobody wants to you know, enroll in an expensive collegiate course and waste all their money with somebody who's just trying to have fun. In fact, a lot of times if I mention that F word in the same sentence with learning, a lot of professors get very standoffish. They think, you know, I'm not here to entertain students. I'm here to teach and they are there to learn, and so I'll do my thing, they do their thing, it's as simple as that. But a lot of research is coming out that indicates it's not quite as simple as that. As many people have already mentioned and cited, uh, uh, the famous John Medina in his book, Brain Rules, um, spent the last several years kind of cracking open the mind and seeing what makes it tick. And he's come up with 12 main rules that govern how we retain information, how our memory functions, and just kind of how our brains have evolved over time. Now, two of these rules deal specifically in regards to the relation of fun and learning. One is simply we don't pay attention to boring things. Uh, it's always kind of awkward coming up and giving a PowerPoint when so many things, in fact, the things that you're often citing say, don't give a PowerPoint, as I'm sure Dr. Miller can, can relate to. Um, you kind of feel like, oh, well, it's OK. I'm, I'm trying something new here. St stick with me. But the fact of the matter is, it doesn't matter how passionate you are about your subject or about how important it is for them to learn it. If, you, if it's presented in a way that is perceived as boring, it's not just, oh, OK, well, some people like it, some people don't. You've got to live with it. It's literally a, a serious challenge to you as a teacher. You are handicapping yourself in a way that makes it very difficult for your students to learn. Now, and I'll say this a million times in this presentation, that absolutely does not mean that you ever need to feel that you have to sacrifice academic rigor for entertainment. But we'll get to that later. The other rule that relates to it is that stress brains, excuse me, stress brains don't quite learn the same way as unstressed brains. So if you're in an environment where you have that screechy nails on a chalkboard noise all the time, then again, they're simply not going to be as receptive to your message. So, Shortly on the coattails of saying the F word and relating to learning, fun is great and it can in fact help us learn, but I absolutely have to make clear that gamification, game-based learning, any of those types of subjects are not just about playing games. In fact, a lot of times they have nothing to do with anything that you'd identify normally as what a game looks like. It's more about stripping out those, the uh, kind of delivery methods of what makes games effective and adding them to your content. So a lot of times I've already mentioned uh, gamification kind of has a little bit of baggage, especially among us in the academic community. Um, and rightfully so. There's a, been a lot of instances where this has been used as a thinly veiled excuse, especially in the corporate world, to just kind of 
trick people into doing stuff they don't want to do. Thinking, oh, if I put a leaderboard and a badge system up on my website, that gets people to stick around more, right? It's what kids like these days, right? Not quite. In fact, that type of gamification, we're not interested in discussing here. We're really more interested in what happens if you took that term and just boiled it down to its very essence, just the utter distillation of gamification. Why do we play games at all? You really to find out that you're discussing motivation. It's about what drives us, what makes our brains tick, how we learn, and even what makes us happy. So you can see the appeal of why gamification caught my attention. If I could approach this material kind of sideways and just focus on their motivation, then I could kind of bypass a lot of those anxieties that they initially had. So it's about the context of how games are effective, not the content. This is something that a lot of people switch up when they hear that game part of gamification. Sometimes it's even better to just emphasize the other syllable and say gamification and trick people into that way, or game-based learning. It's about the context of how they're effective, not the content. So there are three main things that I wanted to try to accomplish using techniques of gamification. I wanted to alleviate that stress, that anxiety that I talked about first. I wanted to encourage peer learning. And I wanted to engage my students more. Now, all of those three things you can do without gamification very easily. And I'm not here to argue that you can't. Um, but when I was doing my research, a lot of these things came so organically when I was learning about principles of gamification that it seemed like a great fit. So how many of you here are familiar with the kind of old school choose your own adventure books or choose your own adventure games, right? Okay, you know, flip to turn, if you take the door on the left, flip to page 84. Okay, door on the right, 95. And then you flip back and read both of them anyway, because you want to get the best result. <laughs> well, what we're going to do here is have a choose your own adventure PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we'll fire up our Computron here. We're going to load a poll question EXE. And I'm going to have you respond to what you want to hear about. This is about building knowledge for you, right? So it's not just about what I want to talk about. You get to choose if you want to talk about that first subject, which was mitigating anxiety. And we've got to give it a few seconds here. The second subject, which is about peer learning. Or the third subject, which is about further engaging your students. So for those of you who have your laptops or your phones with you and are currently checking email and Facebook, that's OK. Continue <laughs> using it. But open a new tab and go to pollev.com. That's P-O-L-L-E-V dot com slash game is a foot. G-A-M-E-I-S-A-F-O-O-T. Now, for those of you who want to participate with your phones, you can also text that as a message, game is a foot, to the recipient 37607. And this is much smoother when the internet is cooperating. So I'm stalling as long as I comfortably can here. Let's check if that poll is not going to correspond. You've got to have backups, right? So let's check this out here. What are we going to focus on? Mitigating anxiety, encouraging peer learning, or increasing engagement? Should have queued up some Jeopardy music as well. Now, either there's a slight delay in internet, or there's just an overwhelming interest in increasing engagement. Now I can see a little bit more of the results here. It looks like increasing engagement is up 23 to 4. So that's pretty strong. We may just need to call the race right there. Take some serious rallying to, to come back from that. So if that's what we want to talk about, that's what we'll talk about. Over here. Now we're playing along. That's always a good noise. Okay. 
OK. So let's see here. We chose C, right? Yes. So let's see if this will finish loading for me here. Engagement. All right. It's worked. <laughs> Woo! I tested that so many times, I was so nervous. All right. <laughs> engagement. We want to learn about how we can improve engagement. Excellent choice. So the first main tenant of engagement. When I'm talking about engagement and gamification or game-based learning, <coughs> it's really a lot like hand and glove. The two go together very, very well. And one of the first main ideas that come up when you are researching gamification is increasing student agency. It's basically about giving students choice or control over their academic career, over their academic participation in your class. So a great example of this is most games today, you play the first you know, introductory <coughs> tutorial level, but then it is no longer linear. It's completely open-ended. You go down path A, B, C, or choose your own. The idea of applying this to a classroom can be really interesting. And by interesting, I also mean terrifying. Um, the best example that I have completely stolen from a mentor of mine was I took a project in my class. Uh, normally, you know, a fairly weighted, fairly you know, good-sized project, and I split it up into three different, nearly identical projects. The first one was you do your research, then you give a presentation in front of the class. The second one, you could do your research and then write a well-cited research paper. The third one, you do your research, then you partner up with whoever you want to partner up with and give a brief uh, mini lesson the next day in class. Now the content of what I was testing for, the, the understanding of mastery for the design principles or whatever it was about, was essentially identical across all three. It's important to note that none of them, including the group-based one, could be seen as harder or easier than the others. Content is the same, but if you give the students the choice, now they think, oh, I can play to my own strengths here, do what I do best, that's going to make me feel a little bit more confident, I got this. I don't have to worry about it. So the extrovert can say, oh, I'm all about presentations. I'll get up there, get my whole song and dance. It's fine, no problem. The introvert would say, oh my goodness, I'm so glad I don't have to go up in front of anybody. I'm just going to knock this research paper out. It's going to be great. And then the very social person who has their best friend in the class or has a crush on the person sitting next to them can have a great excuse to partner up with them and give them any lesson the next day. So this works really well for um, something where you have a central objective you're trying to teach. If you already have a project that's about, like if public speaking in front of the class was an element, then obviously it doesn't quite work if you try to eliminate that aspect. But if it's essentially the same content, but the delivery method is now up to the choice of the student. They choose how they want to demonstrate their level of mastery to you. It's very empowering. A lot of times this level of agency is seen as at odds with the structure of your class. You think, the more agency and choice I give them, then the less control or the less structure the class will feel. It may just feel like crazy. If I say, make a poster, then half of my class is going to, what? Like, what? Well, what specs? What dimensions? Like, what color scheme? What does it need to be about? Like, tell me what to do. I need to know what to do. And rightfully so. If I just kind of threw them in the deep end, that'd be a little anxiety. So what I found is a good sweet spot between agency and just absolute control. Because again, in a design class, it kind of takes the fun out of it to say, OK, checkbox, do you have shadows? Checkbox, do you have good color use? Checkbox, do you have it? And I got so tired of hearing, am I done yet? Am I done yet? Is it good enough? I said, you tell me. What I ended up doing was ramping it up. So as, as the projects and their confidence with the program increased throughout the class, I gave them more and more agency, and I was requesting less and less specifics in my rubrics. So the first ones started off very regimented. You know, I said, yeah, you got all these boxes to check. If you check all the boxes, you get a great grade. Easy as that. And then they slowly start removing those boxes, and I can have a little bit more flexibility. The problem also with design class is if you give them too many boxes, all the projects look the same. You can't do things like Dr. Miller's talking about, testing for critical thinking. It just wouldn't happen if you say, you got to do these 50 different checkboxes. So that's a great balance of kind of easing them off um, that kind of reliance on a very detailed rubric. 
The second aspect is a freedom to fail. This is kind of getting thrown around a lot. Um, a great question to ask is how can a student sit there playing Angry Birds, failing the same level over and over and over and over and over again, and they keep swiping, keep swiping, and they don't give up. But the second I hand them back a quiz or a test that they are not happy with a grade with is, this class is stupid anyways, they didn't dumb trick questions, I don't care, I don't even care about this class. Why do they give, they give up so easily, why? It's because in Angry Birds, they're not really failing. I don't even want to use that word. It's more like they're making attempts. And each attempt that they make, they learn from. OK, that first one was too steep. Maybe I changed the curve a little bit. OK, that didn't work. But maybe I should try this other one from a different level. All right, that was closer, but not quite. If I merge the two, boom, done. What does that look like when we apply that same freedom to academia? Well, you got a couple different options. Us primarily being online educators, we can say, all right, thanks to our powerful LMS, I can say, you have a quiz, it's due by next Wednesday, and I can check a box that says, you can retake it as many times as you want, and I'll just take the highest quiz score. Great, sure. That's a great way to give them that example of, you know what, give it your best shot, but if you put in the work and you start testing before 11.55 p.m. when it's due, and you can try different iterations, you have a better chance of success. That is great at alleviating test anxiety as well. I definitely recommend starting off with that though on a lower risk, lower involvement quiz, something where it's not like a midterm. Now, before anybody starts memorizing what questions they want to throw and grill me with at the end of this lecture, um, I know that there are very reasonable uh, objections to that. People will say, well, what about cheating? You know, if I have you retake it over and over again, you could just kind of grind through it until you eventually get the answers right because you'll know all the, the questions. And other people will say, well, real life isn't structured like that. We don't have safety nets in the business world, so why should I build that into my, my class and coddle them? Yeah. Two very reasonable things to say. Let's take a look at them a little bit deeper. The first one, saying that, whoops, microphone problems here. The first one can easily be amended thanks to a lot of the power that our LMSs give us. We can do things like randomize quiz questions. We can um, put in different timeout periods so there's a cool down of say two or three hours before each attempt. So now it's a lot less appealing to just and try to guess. If I gotta wait three hours before I try again, I'm actually gonna put in some effort. So cheating should definitely be something you should be aware of and be aware of the tools that you have to prevent it, but it shouldn't scare you away from trying any of these things, especially on a low risk assignment. The other aspect, safety net argument. Very important just to say I agree with that. You know, a lot of times we don't have that kind of coddling. Nobody's going to hold your hand when you graduate. But if we really think about it, is our current test structure really mimicking that closely what real life is about? How often in business would a junior account executive do his research, compare the market, put together a report? And just walk straight up to the CEO of the other, you know, the client company and say, here you go, boss man, what do you think? Of course not. There's a ton of iteratives, iterations in that process. He gives it to his team first. They edit, give it back. He gives it to his supervisor second. He edits, gets it back. There's a lot of those moments where we can test failure. In other words, make our attempts and amend accordingly before the big quiz or big qu test in front of the client. The other aspect is the quick feedback reward loop. Again, Angry Birds is our example. Each time you make a swipe, you know exactly how close you were to being successful. Each time you finish a level, you know exactly out of three how many stars you earn. And each time you finish one of those, you can see on the level screen exactly how close you are to finishing the game. At no point are you ever questioning how, much, how far you've come, how far you have to go, and what your trajectory to success looks like. Now this is actually a great spot where some of my least favorite things about gamification, the kind of stereotypical slapdash badges achievements leaderboards solution, actually honestly can do well. Now I look down on those a little bit because so many people, remember how I said gamification has a lot of baggage with it, especially from some of the kind of corporate mentality of if I just do these kind of thin veneer of achievements, leaderboards, then I can get poke people to get them to do what I want. 
I love the idea of badges, as some of our co colleagues have spoken about, in terms of like nano degrees and you know piecemealing larger scale applications. But with some of the smaller applications with gamification, they can feel a little skeevy. However, it's important to note that, that leaderboards and point systems do do an excellent job of keeping students in the loop of their current status. So there's a little bit of give and take. You can figure out um, exactly how much of that you're interested in using and if it, is it worth a possible sacrifice of disillusioning some students. Now one thing that I mentioned along with that is that um, in order to mitigate the anxiety I was talking about earlier, I changed the grading system from your typical average grading system to a point-based one. And I'll discuss that a little bit later, but that in itself does a great job as well of working with a quick feedback loop. The last one is also the broadest. Um, new, there are just too many examples of interactive models for engagement and gamification to count. Um, one of the other things that I seriously gamified in my class was I substituted homework assignments that were typically um, Photoshop-based mini projects or the occasional reading quiz. I switched those out with Photoshop-based puzzles that students would have to use some skill or tool that we talked about in class to reveal some kind of obscured, hidden information inside a Photoshop document, then write a quick synopsis of their thought process, what they tried that didn't work, and then what they eventually, how they figured it out. I'll touch on that again later, but the example of using puzzles to teach Photoshop is a great interactive model that promotes engagement. Using interactive polls during a presentation to change the content on the fly is another small example of interactive content. So, the people have spoken, we're centering on engagement, but I did also not want to let you get out of here without touching at least briefly on the other two aspects I talked about. So with peer learning, it's great at distributing pressure. Obviously anybody who's familiar with peer learning knows that, but in my Photoshop class, this was greatly beneficial. So what I did at the beginning of the semester was I actually, through some initial fact-finding surveys, figured out, okay, who here has experience with Photoshop? I gauged everything from you know, how, much, how much they've been using the program to what's their involvement with, or comfort level with technology, all these different things, and I used that information to try to pair up in, group, in groups of four, however our lab was structured at the time. People who would be in a group with someone who was more advanced and less advanced than them, to get a good mix. Now, a lot of the puzzles that I had as homework assignments, again, a low risk assignment, not worth very much, were open to being done with your group if you wanted to. That was completely optional. As long as each person did their individual write-up of what they tried that didn't work, what they brainstormed, and then how they found out. So you can see how this is a great job of mitigating that pressure of, oh, I'm not techie, or oh, I'm not artistic. If I can look to my right, and Bob has no clue what he's doing in here, I feel a little bit better about myself. Like, well, at least I turned the computer on. Okay, Bob's hopeless, but I got at least a shot. And then if I look to my left, and Sally is a whiz at Photoshop, I'm at least happy she's on my team. You know, it's structured in a way. There's also there was a meta element involving the group work that made them more invested in helping each other out through a semester-long process. They stayed in the same groups the entire time, but that way, Sally, the skilled student, was invested in helping her other groupmates rather than just kind of leaving them off on their own. Which was great for me as a professor because if I'm busy helping someone else and I got a room full of hands up it's so much easier for them to know, oh, well, if I just turn to my left, chances are she's going to have a good idea of at least how to point me in the right direction. All of a sudden, I had a room full of TAs that I didn't have to pay, which is great. It also engages all skill levels. So the advanced students, what would typically happen is they'd get bored immediately. Say, oh, OK, clearly this guy doesn't have anything to teach me. And because it was an introductory class that was required by certain majors, I couldn't ever get a lesson plan that was correctly balanced between challenging enough for the advanced students and simple enough for the beginners. Because like I said, especially when you have beginners that have a lot of anxiety on top of it, there's no, I gotta go real slow and friendly in this class. Okay, just click that button, or just that one right there. 
just move, just move the mouse and just, all right, Sally, will you have a mouse? So this is great in that it gets people involved with each other. It gets them, I actually want them to be talking to each other because they can help each other out. This also has the added benefit, if we're talking way back to you know, Bloom's taxonomy, that top of the pyramid, that creation synthesis stage, if I can get the advanced student to have to clearly articulate and explain how this works, why this works, they actually benefit as well. They crystallize that knowledge in their own mind even better than before. So it's win-win-win across the board. So a brief summary on reducing that anxiety. The main thing I saw was that the anxiety came from expectations. They expected the class to be one way and that that one way would lead to them struggling. Well, if I changed the entire structure, then all of a sudden they don't know what to expect and we're back at square one, which for some professors in this room, they would kill to just start at zero, to just not be in the negative. Just, let's just start with a clean slate and then you can learn from there. The point-based grading system I mentioned briefly earlier. Um, the typical model is very demotivating. Um, essentially, the way to look at it is you start off with 100 and then you're penalized by your teacher for everything you don't know. And I know a lot of people say, well, no, you actually start at zero and you earn points. Well, realistically, in practice, when a student gets an assignment back, they don't think, wow, 70 points. That's so much more than zero. <laughs> Look at what I've learned. No, they're all, oh my gosh, I'm barely, I'm barely passing. I've missed these 30 points. Like, what am I doing? It's very demotivating because your grade is also fluctuating all the time. If you have an early setback, say you didn't sleep that well that night, you have a test and you get a bad grade on it, then you are looking at the rest of the semester as a massive uphill battle. You have to get A after A after A just to bring your average back up into the B range. So it's so easy for a student to look at that climb ahead of them. It's, it's not worth it. It's going to check out. And so even just by changing that a little bit and saying, all right, now you start at zero. Start at the bottom. Now we're here. If you do anything, your grade will always go up. Always. So if you fill out a quiz, okay, great, 50 points. You do the homework, all right, 40 points. And it's very satisfying to see that number always climbing. Now what this does not mean, again, we're not holding hands, we're not sacrificing academic rigor. The, the, the quiz was actually out of 70 points and the homework was actually out of 80, but they're focused less on what they missed and more on the progress they're making. They see I, everything I do, I'm getting closer to my goal, rather than sometimes it's one step forward and five steps back and I'm all over the place. So that's actually just kind of a small tweak more on the back end that happens kind of more up here with the students. But just by slightly changing their outlook, you can pull up a lot more confidence and a lot more effort. And sometimes those two things are all you need to have the difference of a passing and a failing grade. And as I mentioned earlier, that unique group work, sharing the responsibility, helping each other out, also mitigates anxiety very well. So how have I actually done this in my class? What I decided to do, I needed a place to store all of these different puzzles. So I built this companion website called intowhitespace.com. Uh, you can feel free to go there now and stop listening to me if you like. Um, and it's essentially a way to arrange these puzzles so that you finish one puzzle, you move on to the next. And alongside that, I also sprinkled in a little bit of overarching narrative so that every few puzzles you actually unlock another clue or another piece of a story. We'll touch on that why later on. But I wanted to spend a lot of time crafting this. It's, it's currently most of the content, to be honest, is down for maintenance right now, but the first few puzzles are up, and we're even going to get to do one or two of them together here in a moment. But when I was setting out to do this, I really wanted to examine, all right, what do I really want to teach in class? And one of the things that came up a lot when I was researching gamification is that it's a great tool for teaching soft skills that are often very difficult to assess. So sometimes it's hard for us to, to qualify things like determination or empathy, leadership. But these are exactly the kind of skills that people are looking for in the workplace once the students graduate. So I figured even if I didn't have the you know, magic bullet way to grade and assess those things, I can at least cultivate an environment that encourages it. 
So even though I can't check a box that says 10 points for leadership, I can put you in situations where that skill is grown. So even things like the logo and the, the name, white space from the design point of view is about everything aside from the regular main content. And a lot of times it's completely overlooked or even invisible to people who aren't looking for it, but it's integral to how you arrange your content. I wanted to encourage my students to be develop developing that designer's eye and to be able to see what most people don't see. Look for the details in everyday life and to not accept things at face value. All soft skills that I wanted to encourage. So this, if, you, if you've started on the site, there's a couple of introductory pages that it's like, here's where you should look for clues. Sometimes you click things, sometimes you type things. This is where you eventually end up. And so the first day of class, I, have, I navigate them through the first few pages and we end up on this fake blog site. It's me and my, my co-teacher here, Hong Ka. And I say, all right, work with your groups. Your puzzle is hidden somewhere on this page. See if you can figure out where it is. So it's not quite as cool and flashy as our uh, attention test there, but you can actually look right now and see if something is amiss. And I'll give you a few moments before I do the big review. Again, kind of need that Jeopardy music going in the background here. It's OK. Don't feel foolish. You're all at a huge disadvantage being way across the room. The reason, if you read it, that things are worded so awkwardly is not because I'm that bad of a writer, I hope, but it's because I tried to stiltedly arrange it so that the first word going down spells something out. It says, click the stars, night will show truth. So the keen observer students can see the stars down here. And once they click them, they're prompted with a Photoshop download. So already, OK, there's a few eyebrows that get raised. And they're like, all right, maybe I'm interested in this Photoshop class. Let's see what this guy has to offer. So let's do our first puzzle in our design class together. Generally speaking, I try to structure it so that there are clues that help them with these puzzles. They can look for the clues in the source code of the HTML. They can look for it in the titles of the files they download. But the general clue that they always have is that if they use a tool that we talked about in class that day, it's more than likely going to help them solve the puzzle. So first day of class, we're doing our introductions. We're keeping it very simple. And let me get this situated here. We talk about the Move tool, which is one of the simplest tools in Photoshop. So our clues, we got something to do with the Move tool. It's called Sunset. And we have the other clue, Night Will Show Truth. Eventually, students realize they need to make the sun Go down. I'm just sure all of you are chiming. Yeah, I knew that. Yeah. <laughs> no, the chimney. I saw the chimney is different. I'm good at these games. Let's go. Bring them on. What's the next one? <laughs> so I, I, tell, I, get, I get them in groups. They're solving it. And it's sure enough, in a few minutes, somebody is brave enough to click and drag the sun down. And you can't quite see at the bottom there, but some text begins to appear as soon as they do that a la Lord of the Rings, it says, <laughs> says, to reach the dawn, we must tread through night. Determined seekers shall find the light. Very cryptic and mysterious. But it serves an important purpose. If they realize, all right, I've kind of solved it, but I need to go through the night all the way to dawn, then they get the real solution, the URL to the following puzzle. Now, I love this puzzle in class for several reasons. One is that, generally speaking, I get at least a few woos and ahs, which shamelessly I, I revel in as a professor. I love being able to show something to my students that for once gets, them, gets a good reaction out of them. But secondly, I like structuring it this way because, again, that soft skill, that determination I want to teach. If the very first puzzle is kind of a two-parter, if you first realize how to solve it but you have to keep going before you give up, I'm hoping that they can take that frame of mind and apply it not only to future puzzles that may be even harder, but also just to the class and life in general. You know, sometimes if you think you're onto something, just don't give up and you'll probably figure it out. The great thing about Photoshop is that it also allows me to bake in some different kind of training wheels for the first couple of puzzles. So I can lock out different things I don't want them to touch. 
I built it in so that if they drag the sun sideways, it shows a message that's like, hey, the sun doesn't go that way. You're an adult. Why do I have to tell you this? And, it's, and they're like, oh, yeah, down. I meant down, yeah. And then they drag it down, and they're like, oh, cool, the text appears. Great. So I love that style of interaction. It's no longer as dry as reading in a book about how to use the move tool. Now they're on to something. Now they're like, OK, I, I'm at least paying attention more than I normally would be. Now the narrative. This is the second part that I briefly mentioned earlier. Puzzles are great for certain people. Sometimes you just have a mindset where if you see a puzzle, your brain has to solve it. There's some people that that's just how they're wired. They see that and they think, I got, I got to figure this out. I can't just hold my calls. I got to figure this out. Other people, not so much. But for certain people, a different hook I could build into this white space was the story. As compelling as some unsolved puzzles are, finding out what happens next is like crap to some people. They just, I, yeah, I, I don't care. Like, I'll tune in next week. Like, I'll, okay, let's, let's see if Hulu has it. Does Hulu have it? I got to see what happens next. So this narrative basically gives a brief snippet of this kind of overarching conspiracy theory mystery story. And each couple of puzzles they solve, they get another little clue. Now the overarching meta idea for this game is that you do the puzzles as homework throughout the class, but then at the end, as you're writing in your blogs, you know, okay, I'm taking notes how I solve the puzzle, but you also take notes on the pieces of the story. At the end of the semester, students can write a brief summary of all the information they've gathered. So they try to solve the mystery, you know, who did it, who's involved, how big is the scale of this conspiracy theory? And whoever can submit the most information by having completed the most puzzles, because at some point they become optional, wins a prize. Usually it's better to not announce what it is. Um, if it's just a few bonus points, if it's coffee, whatever, it doesn't really matter. In fact, the size of the prize doesn't, is not important. Sometimes just knowing that, hey, I, I need to do a lot of this homework anyways, and oh, sure, I might as well just try to figure out what happens. Sometimes that's enough, rather than offering you know, a big pile of bonus points at the end, then they switch that from the intrinsic motivation of, I want to see what happens, or I want to get better at Photoshop, to, I just want bonus points, so I'm going to beg, borrow, and steal to do whatever I have to to get to the end. So what do we call this style of online interactive learning thing? Earlier I called it a companion site, but if I'm being fully honest, that's not the scope that I'm looking at. My, my dream in my heart of hearts is to actually make this thing much bigger. With enough time, I would love to have White Space 2.0 look something like it does now, but with more features that can kind of be automated in terms of advancement. And I could offer it so that if some student was like, ah, you know, I got a busy class, I'm an athlete, or I'm debating, I'm traveling a lot, I'm going to miss a lot of class anyways, I'll just do, I'll just follow along with white space and I will honestly write my synopsis of each puzzle. I'll you know, honestly write my um, collective of narrative toward the end. And if they do that, then honestly, they may not need to come into class. If I could make this robust enough that I can teach the same skills, I can teach the determination, I can teach the actual Photoshop, I can teach the actual design theory well enough in this style of setting then maybe coming to class can be optional. Even further, maybe enrollment would be optional. My dream is that I could have something like this be completely open and free so that whoever stumbled upon this website could teach themselves a better chunk of Photoshop than a standard YouTube tutorial could teach them. I would love to have something like this be free for anybody to use while rigorous enough to actually be developing skills. So you can see how something like that doesn't really fit the definition of companion site anymore. If it actually did grow to that scale, it's something else entirely. It's almost like a course replacement. So I was thinking to myself, how can I come up with, what, what word do I use to describe this? It's interactive, it's engaging, it's online, it's alternative, it's not traditional. And then I realized, Props to Dave Cormier. Acronyms are hard. Like, I'm not good at this. I, all the ones I came up with were like 20 letters long. I was like, this is not defeating the purpose of an acronym. So, that's where you come in. 
we're going to fire up our computer again and see, cross our fingers if this works, if not, we'll just move forward and pretend like it did, what we want to call it. We have a couple of different options here. The first one, while this is loading, hopefully, um, NTOC, an NTOC. I like the idea of something that's a little general, so a non-traditional online course could kind of encompass what I'm talking about here. Um, but this is a little abstract. Again, it's not really a real word. So the more patriotic version is Experiential Alternative Game Learning Environment, or EGLE. So you can say that while pledging allegiance. Um, the last two are Alternative Game-like Interactive Learning Experience, or Agile. I like that one because it, it implies a sort of um, flexibility that the course is capable of. Switch poles here. And the last one is ICE, Interactive Course Experience. Now, perhaps most importantly, there is an unlisted fifth option, which is go to Twitter and please write something better than what I've come up with, because these are works in progress. And like she said, if we all get paid to think for a living, right? Which was a great pat on the back. I appreciate that compliment you gave earlier. If we all get paid to think for a living, somebody here can use some hashtags or use some at signs to figure out a good term for this. So it's looking like we have a couple patriots in the room. They're coming in at three. Agile's a little bit better, though. It's coming in a little stronger. So let's pretend that that is our current winner here. We will stick with Agile until a genius reveals themselves on Twitter and we figure out a better word for it. Oh, there it's loading. It always waits until I exit and make a fool out of myself before it comes in and decides to play along. Let's see. All right, so which one did we pick here? Let's see, that one was Agile, right? Agile it is. So. If this term actually takes off, if some of you are as inspired and, and your hearts are just swelling with ideas now from my fantastic presentation, as I'm sure you are all, then it'll be great to know that we were a part of history today. We all coined this term together. But what does that actually allow us to do? What does this agile thing look like in terms of how it affects my actual class? Like, could I just get along without it? Well, there are three main things that it can do. My class, MSCO 371, allows me to do three different things with white space that I couldn't without it. The first one is that I can extend the scope of class. I intentionally have some of the puzzles that have to be solved with software I never talk about. I never teach at all. So, for example, um, one of the puzzles they download is an MP3 that is this really slow speaking voice that's also reversed. And the hint that they get is they need to download Audacity, a free audio editing program. Now, I don't tell them anything about how to learn Audacity. They just get this weird sounding, sounding MP3, and they think, okay, well, maybe if I reverse it. All right, that's close, but it's still a little too slow. How, how can I make this go faster? I'll check out YouTube or I'll check out the help page. And they do it. And once they figure that out, I get more people that come in the next day that said, that was so cool. I've never even heard of that program. And I spent, you know, a couple hours last night just playing around on it. Like, oh, music to my ears. I love hearing that kind of stuff as a professor. So I could, everybody knows we have a finite amount of time actually with students, whether they're in class or, or just online in class. But if we can use things like this to extend the reach of what we are capable of teaching, while engaging them enough and making them invested enough to actually take advantage of it, then we can accomplish a lot more with our short amount of time. The second thing is it allowed me to tell richer stories. So like I said, that main overarching narrative that they figure out, one of the neat things that I enjoy writing is that in this conspiracy that they're uncovering, there is just enough real articles that I did not make up that have to do with this conspiracy where they're like, <laughs> I, I know it's just for fun, right? I know it's just for fun, but like, but like this is just this is just for fun, right? <laughs> like, there's just enough doubt in their minds that they're like, "Am I really uncovering this huge? Is this guy really dead?" 
And I love that because it gets them to feel like they're a part of something much bigger than themselves. And that quest for epic meaning, as Jane McGonigal references it in her book, uh, Reality is Broken, um, is something we're actually priming our minds and brains to seek out. As we get these experiences through you know, enjoyment in the movies or through pursuing them in, in games in our free time that, that involve saving the world, then we're more likely to seek out those experiences in our life as well. So number three, there are real life activities I can do that otherwise, mostly due to time, I could never do in class. So example again of my face to face, I can have my students, you know, one of the puzzles ends up leading them to physical spots on campus. They have to take a picture of a certain piece of art, or um, one of my favorite ones is I actually lead them to where my office is so that they know where to go for office hours. <laughs> I can't tell you how many people are like, I didn't know we could talk to you at any time. I'm like, it's in the syllabus. I mentioned it in class. I say, hey, come by my office. I introduce you to my office. Like, I, finally, I have a way to sh get them to actually come. Um, another thing is great is you can actually lead them on a little mini scavenger hunt that takes them to other um, resources they have available on campus. So things like a writing center or a library where in a different you know, lab of computers with Photoshop is. I use those things as well. In terms of how that relates to online, there's a couple different things. You, you gotta get creative with it, but you can say, okay, today's activity in class while we are having our sync session is, drum roll, brrr, whatever your laptop is currently sitting on is the surface we're working with. And whatever surface you're on, you have to MacGyver whatever the things that are touching it are to solve a problem of, say, getting water from a sink into a really heavy tub at the bottom. Okay, well, uh, what do I got? I got some paper here, all right. Uh, I got a candle. Uh, maybe I fold the paper up into a cup, and then I melt the candle, and then it's waterproof, and then I do this, and I swim in, and that's great. Okay, I figured it out. Little things like that to kind of break it up and say, okay, stop staring at the screen for a little bit. Maybe get up and stretch your legs, go to the next room if you have to, which again is one of Medina's 12 brain rules, by the way. Have a little bit of exercise can give us a little jolt for helping us remember things. But if nothing else, once you leave this session, I want you to just think of this as a reason to re-examine what it is or why it is you do what you do. If nothing else, even if you decide none of these principles matter, uh, they're silly, it's not enough research, that's fine. But if you just walk away and re-examine why you do what you do, then hopefully I, will be, I can consider myself a success. So remember that pile of Lego from earlier? Each and every one of us as teachers knows that any student that comes into our class could be the one capable of taking this huge disorganized pile of potential and turning it into something incredible, something amazing. Yes, this is a real working car built out of Legos. So because of that, because of that potential in each one of our students, it's up to us as educators to seek out these new solutions that unlock that potential. I believe gamification is a step in the right direction. If we can use its principles to mitigate their learning anxieties, to foster group work and peer learning, and to increasingly engage them in the material that they're learning in our class, and we are going to be blown away by what they're capable of. Thank you. Okay. Who has the first question? So is there some sort of consulting company that can help faculty gamify their classes, like sort of like a Lumen Learning of gamification? <laughs> that is a great question. And unfortunately, I personally am not aware of one yet. Um, I, do, I have stumbled across a few contenders that may do something like that. There's a couple of people who actually started off more on the game side of the industry, actually making video games for a living and decided education has a lot of potential, which is a great example of how some of our colleagues have said, hey, if we don't do this as educators, if we don't tackle these problems, somebody from the private sector will. That's a perfect example. I apologize their name eludes me right now, but there is instances of that happening. I think 
there's more of a grassroots campaign. It's, it's piqued some academics' interest, but I haven't heard of a lot of like rising powerful firms just yet that offer that as a skill. It's kind of trickling in through um, instructional designers and people who just happen to be passionate about it at certain universities. But hopefully through lectures and speeches like today at this conference, we can at least generate enough interest but that becomes a very viable business option. Um, I think this is very creative, and I've already got a couple of ideas from what you've talked about. Excellent. Um, I wondered if you had more than one set of puzzles created, because if, you know, do you have students that get questions or ask people from a previous semester and get clues from uh, somebody who's already taken your course? That's definitely a valid concern. Like I said, Anything that you do online, when you kind of separate that element or you add that, that uh, anonymity, you run the risk of being aware of cheaters or how you need to lock that down. And that's why, I, like I said, I made it more group-based and for low-risk um, assignments. Honestly, if you just cheated through every single one, okay, but I'm going to know it because, A, in your write-up that you do of explaining your thought process, explaining what you tried that didn't work, and then how you finally solved it will either be identical to the person you got it from, or it's going to be nonsensical and useless, and I'll know you're up to something. The other, the other alternative is that this kind of byproduct of getting people to play with these puzzles had this great effect of like, oops, I learned how to do Photoshop. Like, mm. I could see in their work they were improving just because they were spending more time in the chair clicking the buttons and not being afraid to, to try things out. So a student that cheated and just got all the answers from somebody else, their work will almost certainly be at least noticeably worse than people of comparable skill levels progressing throughout the class. They just won't grow as much as somebody else. That's a good concern, though. OK, Holly. There's a bit of an honor element to that as well, where you can say at the beginning of the class, uh, and actually, an old slide I had that I decided I had to take out for time was some of these puzzles, I'm not going to lie to you, took a lot of time for me to work on. I would spend like four hours working on this thing, and I'd submit it, and then it would be like, oh, done. <laughs> Ten minutes, that one's hard. And I'm like, oh, I'm so proud of you, and I hate you so much. <laughs> so some of the elements of gamification do require a lot of investment of time initially, but they pay off in dividends because you can not just repurpose, but kind of tweak your content and refine it as time goes on, and you don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. Yes? I was just uh, remembering some learning games that my son had, and occasionally the wrong answer or the wrong step was more interesting, exciting than the right one. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you pay attention to when you build your puzzles? Yes. In fact, one of the most fascinating things that I completely didn't expect is how many different ways people would come up to the solution that I was going for. Because in my mind, you know, having done this for a while, I have a certain way that may or may not be the shortest distance between two points in Photoshop. It's such a powerful program that there's dozens of ways to do any single action in the program. So by having them write up, the thing I'm most interested in is not how they actually solved it, but their thought process of what they tried first lets me know sometimes a lot more than how they actually solved it. Because if they're like, well, first, I try to turn the computer off and then going and doing something else with my life for 10 hours. I'm like, hmm, <laughs> they're not very engaged in this. i got to figure something out. Or if they list something else that's completely in the wrong direction, I need to be like, oh, OK, I should be a little bit more clear in this, what this tool is for so that they can realize, oh, this is so much easier if I just figured this one button out. Um, so because of that, I never penalize them for doing it a different way than I did. It helps me refine the puzzles actually each time because I can either build in more safeguards for some of the initial puzzles that make it kind of a narrower path for you to, to kind of stumble around and figure it out. Or I can just say, oh, that's interesting. I had no idea you could even do that. But yeah, another very good question. Um, what happens if they get stuck? Has there ever been a situation where they can't actually figure it out? And what, what do you do in that instance? I was just curious. The way I structured some of these, because to be honest, it was a little bit of work getting everything finished on my end and uploaded to white space before progressing. Sometimes I did just use a learn, my learning management system. We do an instance of Sakai. So I could just kind of load them as, as assignments. Um, 
But what I love was when I talked earlier about how this is great for different skill sets, or um, abilities, rather. One of my advanced students spent two weeks chewing on the same puzzle over and over and over again. He'd submit it. No, that's not right. OK, uh, try this again. Submit it. No, it's not right. All right, well, I'll Google it. No, that's not right. Or, oh, I'll ask somebody else. OK, they didn't quite help either. Oh, I'll ask somebody outside of class. And when they finally got the solution, there was just this physical change in their body where they're just like, oh, I figured it out, finally. And they wrote in a course about the end, they said, sometimes this class was way, way too hard, and you expected way too much of us. But I've never felt like I earned a grade more than I did in this class. So that, I'm fine with. I don't care if, if, it's, if it's really hard. As long as you feel like you're earning it, I'm happy. So a couple of the puzzles, like I said, especially later on, I make optional. So they don't necessarily have to do it. And some of the harder ones, in fact, are just optional, or the occasional one would be for bonus points, um, just to give a challenge to the students who want to rise to the challenge. Um, but there's, there's never one that I have intentionally scaled up difficulty-wise that should just be impossible. Because again, they can ask anybody else in the class to help them out. Yes? So I was just curious with this flipping and the way you thought about uh, grades and is a sort of a score that they're earning? Yes. Uh, the two things that make me, or I have a question about that on. Uh, one is, do you give them like in limited attempts to keep improving their score? And do you have a score range they need to meet for certain grades? That's a very good question. In fact, I have a couple slides. If we had chosen a different path, you would have seen. <laughs> so I will see if I can bring those up now. More details. This was under, if we had talked primarily about it. Um, the way I did grading was on a point system. So, like I said, traditional model, even if you get a couple good grades at the beginning, fluctuates a lot. It goes up, it goes down, and that early outset can be very detrimental. Whereas the gamification one was like every single thing you do keeps you going up and up. This also gives me a little bit more flexibility to say, all right, you came in for office hours. That's worth a small amount of points. Or, hey, you organized a tutoring session with, with your peers. That's worth a, a couple extras. Now, I kept a running tally of how what possible points they could have physically earned at certain points. And I would announce, all right, if you have at least 300 points, you're on track for an A in the class. Or the most you could possibly have right now is 500 points. Sometimes I would say the highest score in the class has 800. The lowest one has 75. Where are you in that range? If you would like to be higher, you should probably do more of the optional assignments to make up the ground that you may have lost. So truth be told, there's only a handful of assignments that I really let them retake that often. It's generally the puzzles that are just homework and maybe a, a low-level quiz or two in the beginning. But at the end, my expectations, I let them know, increase as they become more comfortable or more familiar with the class. And I say, eventually, you got to step it up. And, and give it a shot. So there's even some things that they really don't like. I have a midterm that's timed, and they have to do, be able to do Photoshop like right then. And everyone hates it. They always say, it's way too hard. You spend way too much of this. I get that a lot, in case you haven't noticed. Way too hard. Um, but I tell them, it's not just about what you did in Photoshop for this. It's about how you perform under pressure. It's about how much you've been studying things like your hotkeys, so I can know that you can quickly get this stuff. And it also kind of helps me figure out, hey, are you just kind of coasting along or having your group do a lot of the lifting, or are you actually on top of your game and you know how to do this? So giving those status updates, letting them know exactly what their score is every single time, uh, letting them know, hey, if you're on par with the course, you should be on this number puzzle, things like that kind of let them know how they're doing. OK, so I think um, I'm going to cut the questions a little bit short here um, so that we can move on. But I really want to thank you, Landon, for, uh, for coming and for your awesome presentation. So if you haven't tried the Into the White, like go to Into the White and start white to space. try the little mm -hmm. white space, sorry, um, uh, you should really go and try it. And I, I can tell you, I've done it. I've gone through as far as I can get. I actually got to the Photoshop thingy. Um, and fired it up with GIMP and tried to do it again. <laughs> um, it's really, really beautiful and also very, very fun. So thank you very much. Thank you.